Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm happy that you're here. We're going to get started. Thank you all for coming to our Save a Life Week. We're kicking off today with our uh, panel for the journey of the ultimate gift. I want to give thanks to a couple of people or acknowledge everyone that is here. And I want to start with our panel members. And I'm going to start from your right to left. <laughs> I'm going to start with introducing Maria Wheel. Mm -hmm. She is a kidney transplant coordinator for St. Joseph's Hospital. And then next to her is Steve Lang. And Steve is a donor, and he's going to tell us about his journey. Then we have our very own Joe Salcedo, who is a human services associate professor. Um, this process is, is near and dear to my heart um, because of Joe's journey. And then we have Lacey Wood, and Lacey is with One Legacy. Lacey is a donor recipient, and she's going to give us a lot more information about the process. Let's give our panel a round of applause. Thank you. My name is Kim Branch Stewart. I'm the Chair of Human Services, and I'm very, very happy to be here and be part of this potentially life-saving journey. I want to acknowledge again several people who are instrumental in putting this, this uh, week-long event together. This is a collaborative process with the Health Sciences and Human Services. Sue Forrester with Hoag. Sue, would you stand up and just say hello? <laughs> Hi, Sue. Thank you. She's been instrumental in working with the college for quite some time in organizing blood donations. So, Sue, thank you so much for, for helping to make this happen today. Chris Hargraves, who I don't see, he is with ASG, but I do see an ASG team here, ladies. Thank you so much. They have been so instrumental and supportive with organizing everything, giving us support. Uh, we can't thank you all enough. The team has been fabulous. So thank you, ladies. Uh, Gina Cousineau, who is not here today, but we're going to kick off today's presentation with a very brief video of her daughter, Mary Cousineau, um, who was a, a donor and helped save a life. And we're going to just, you're going to see a little bit about her story and her very tragic loss of her son. So we're going to open up with that in just a moment. And, and then I want to thank Martine Weir. Martine, would you stand up, please? Give Martine a hand. Martine is such a powerhouse. Martine has worked as associate faculty with Human Services and now has, for quite some time now, has been working as or is the uh, director of the Foster and Kinship Care Program here at Saddleback College. So thank you all so much. I want to thank also Matt Broday and Scott Green on sound. Matt Broday is video, video recording this session, so thank you guys so much. We have a couple of our faculty here from Human Services, Christine, and of course our very own Sean Osborne. Hi, you guys. Thank you. And I see a very dedicated student who I'm not going to forget, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for being here. So thank you all. We're going to get started. Um, if I forgot anyone, please forgive me in advance. I do want to point out that the blood donations and registry is right across the hall in SSC 212. For more information or to sign up, please avail yourselves to the services across the hallway when we conclude here. I will be over there to register for to become a bone donor or whatever I can do, you know, where they say, put your money where your mouth is. So I will be over there. I've given blood, but I'm going to take it a step further as well. So thank you all for being here. We're going to start off with this brief video, as I stated, and then we're going to hear from our panel members. Time permitting, we will conclude with Q&A. So thank you all for your patience. Finally tonight, it was last November that John McKenzie had a report on this broadcast about a boy who would die if he didn't get a kidney transplant. The family of another very sick young boy saw that report, and out of their tragedy arose a heartwarming desire to help. Here's John. When we last saw Dominic Lawson, he was in desperate need of a kidney transplant, but his tissue type matched only 3% of the population. As long as I'm sitting here, I'll search the globe to try to find him a kidney. At the same time, in that same Minneapolis hospital, 
Another family was fighting to save their own little boy. Nine-year-old Evan Cousineau was being treated for a rare genetic disease. The Cousineaus and the Lawsons would see each other in the hallways, but each family was focused on its own battle. One would end early. Evan Cousineau died last November. His sister Mary and the rest of the family flew back home to California. Weeks later, Mary saw that story we did on Dominic and the need for living kidney donors. But Dominic could wait five or six years for a donated kidney. <laughs> Honestly, I couldn't imagine another family going through what we were going through. That evening, Mary emailed the Lawsons, saying, Give me some more information. I want to help out. Kelly Lawson was eager for another candidate. 300 volunteers had already been screened, and not one was a good donor match. But she told Mary to wait. Considering all that they've been through, I didn't want her to rush into anything. I wanted her to have time to heal and to grieve for her brother's loss. And that is what Mary did. Three months later, Mary Cousineau and her family came back to the hospital to thank the doctors and nurses who had tried to save her brother. At the end of the visit, she went down to the dialysis ward to see Dominic. I was just so excited to see him, and he was laying in that bed and just looking at him and just knowing that I needed to help him. Not only was Mary now ready to be tested, she was certain she would be the one. She said that she just felt it in her heart. You need to do this. You're going to be a donor match. A few weeks later, the Lawsons got the call. A perfect match had indeed been found. On May 21st, Mary Cousineau gave Dominic Lawson that kidney he desperately needed. Come on! Today... Yeah. <laughs> he's so much more active and happy and playing, and he's so full of life. It's just such a joy to see. The Cousineaus and the Lawsons are now forever joined. One family, in its grief, reaching out to save the other. Of course, we say thank you and that we love you, but I mean, I don't think that you can ever express, you know, the emotion and the gratefulness that we truly feel. It's a blessing every minute that I look at him. John McKenzie, ABC News, Minneapolis. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started with our panel now. Um, we're going to start with Maria. If you can tell us a little bit about what you do, what we need to know as far as donations are concerned, kidney donations are concerned, what is it that you would want us to know about the process? Well, I'm a registered nurse and I work at St. Joseph's Hospital and I'm involved with uh, kidney transplant patients um, from the beginning um, all through their, their health care. Um, patients that are on dialysis or uh, near dialysis come to us because transplant is one of, weight, one of two ways of treating kidney failure. Um, the interesting thing about kidneys is that you don't need 100% of kidney function to be normal. You only need about 30% of kidney to be normal, to live a normal life. And so that's how um, we're able to transplant one kidney into someone and give them a near normal life. The, um, so I see a patient when they um, are considering transplantation and we evaluate them because unfortunately uh, with kidney disease comes other medical problems that would complicate their transplant. So not every patient that is in need of, a, that is on dialysis can receive a kidney transplant. They're not well enough. But those that are well enough then face a tremendously long waiting time to get an organ. There's a severe shortage of organs for transplantation, all organs, and, and, and especially kidneys. So patients um, may die while they wait. Um, so again, a, a person only needs 30% of kidney function to feel normal. Um, so if a person can donate a kidney, um, that's a wonderful thing. Um, at St. Joseph's Hospital, we take care, very good care of our donors. We protect their confidentiality. We protect their, um, their health. Um, we want them to stay healthy. Um, so we counsel our donors very carefully. Um, but the best part of my job is when I get to call somebody up and say, we have a kidney for you. Very good. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Steve Lang, um, who again is a, um, recip a recipient, a donor, excuse me, a donor. <laughs> Steve, can you share with us what motivated you to get involved in organ, organ donation and explain to us that process? Sure. 
um, it, it really was a faith-filled decision for me. Uh, a, uh, a, a woman and, and, and gentleman in my church um, were both, he, he needed a kidney. He actually had a kidney transplant from his brother and it had lasted seven years. But um, it, it had failed and he was on dialysis three days a week for a couple of years. And uh, he was on a waiting list which was gonna be seven years. He had a seven-year-old son, and I thought, you know, and this, this guy is one of the nicest guys, and I said, he just needs to be around for his son, really. And I knew nothing about kidney disease. I hadn't had any exposure to it in my family or anything. I just had had a very healthy life and um, thought, well, and I, and I gave blood a lot <laughs> over the years. So I thought, oh, positive, you know, maybe that was it. I didn't, didn't know anymore. And my daughter, who's in public health, said, Dad, it's a little more than that. So anyway, um, went in and uh, had all the tests done. And um, to kind of follow up on your, your discussion, they called me and said at my office, and they said <clears throat> um, that I was a match. And then I had, I had the chance to call and tell Jamie, my friend, that I was a match. We're, he's driving, I call his, call his home and his wife says, oh, she goes, oh, you know, call him. He's driving um, Christopher to school. So I call and, you know, I've never, my words have never made that much of a difference in a person's life, to be honest. And <clears throat> Jamie just started yelling in the car and his, dad, his son goes, what is it, dad, what is it? He goes, Steve's gonna give me his kidney. And I would, had tears, I had tears. <laughs> You know, I had tears on the other end of the phone because who gets a chance to say that? Honestly, who gets a chance to say that? And um, anyway, uh, went through about a year's worth of having to get my, get my uh, blood pressure down a bit and all. But uh, we went actually to Cedar sinai is where I had it done. And we, the last day of, uh, of going through the tests and all and just making sure everything was okay, uh, we, there were some forms that had to be filled out. And again, not knowing... I thought they needed to be done by a, you know, a, uh, some some official means, and they said, no, no, no. You just go out into the out into the uh, waiting room, and just ask someone to be a witness. So Jamie and I walk out into the waiting room. Jamie's a little shorter than I am, and he goes. We walk into the room about this size, and people all in there. And he goes, "Ladies and gentlemen," you know, and I'm like. <laughs> I want to die. I mean, I really, I, this is a very personal and quiet thing, and I don't want to. And he goes, you know, he goes, this guy's going to give me his kidney. You know, he's a hero. And I was just like, oh. And then I thought, you know, he is so happy. And all these people in this waiting room are hoping for the same thing, right? And I said, um, you know, I just took it and just lived, went with it, you know? And uh, that was just a great, and everybody's raising their hand. I want to do, you know, I want to write it down. They go, well, are you brothers? Are you, what's your relationship? And I said, well, we're, we're good friends. And our families, it's really a family friend. So that worked out great. And then the final thing I'll tell you, and I don't say this to everyone, but after I dropped Jamie off, I'm driving home. And you know how that, you have that sort of, a human reaction to say, if everything is, is this all, if this all works out, you know, and I just need a little, uh, you know, um, what do I want to say? Sign. Yeah, a sign. Just give me a sign that this is going to work out. And I swear, I'm driving on the 405 freeway, and there's a voice, and granted, it's not from inside the car, but it's in my head, but it's a voice I've never heard before, and it was Steve, and I just was like, it's a Steve. <laughs> This is one of the purposes of your life. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I almost drove off the side of the road, honestly. <laughs> I walked in, I went, I went to my church. I went to my church, directly to my church, and I said, thank you so much for that. And I walked into my house, and my wife's going, what is it? She could tell. And she goes, what is it? And I said, I just had the most incredible experience. And I knew it was going to be fine after that. I knew for sure it was going to be okay. And, and it all worked out perfectly. Um, you know, the, the surgery went well. It was funny, because I was mentioning this before. I'm in the top of Cedar sinai um, Hospital, and they have the donor's room is as big as this almost, and it had, looks out all over LA, and there's these big flat screen TVs, and it was just amazing. Yeah, my priest came to visit, and he goes, wow, this looks like the head rabbi should be in here, or the, <laughs> or the bishop, you know? And, and um, 
um, I said, yeah, you know, and I was still kind of recuperating. It was two, two days I was in the hospital. And then I went down to see Jamie, who was on the floor below me, and I kind of shuffled down there, and he was in this broom closet almost. It was a tiny oh. little room. <laughs> And he had the biggest smile on his face, and he looked great. I mean, he was just all that color back and just, you know, himself. And he was eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he says, I've been waiting to eat one of these for three years. <laughs> and it was amazing. So then after that, I thought, well, how do I take this further? You know, I mean, I've given the kidney, and everything's good. But um, And then I found about, about Donate Life and... Um, decided to get involved in that to see if it could you know if I could go further and help and that's what's brought me here today and a couple of years ago I walked in the in the rose parade with donate life Aww. next to the float and um, that was an incredible experience too if there's time I'd, I'd tell you a little more about that but uh, to be honest I would do it all again and um, I would just encourage anybody that has that feeling, like when she was sp speaking on the video about just sensing that this is something that she should do and that she had the ability to do it, I've, it's not affected me at all. My doctor says just drink lots of water because a busy kidney is a happy kidney, and that's about all I do. I've been, it hasn't affected me in any other way than that, and I feel great, and to help someone in that way is like nothing you can imagine. It's, it just changes your life. My life has been changed as well, so. That's incredible, thank you so much. Thank you. Joe, would you please share, um, share with us your experience or how you came to, to be on a waiting list for a kidney and how it's impacted your life? Well, it, it would appear the type of kidney I have and Depending on, depending on which transplant center or medical facility you talk to, um, they'll say there's so no, many numbers of kidney disease, variants, variances of the disease. A lot of authorities will focus in on about 10 different diseases, uh, one of which is called polycystic. And if you take the word apart, poly meaning many, cystic meaning cysts. And so, my mother died from kidney disease about 30 years ago, and at the time she was going, undergoing hemodialysis. That's the one where you go to the center and sit for three days, anywhere from four to six hours, three days a week. And I remember her going through so many side effects and difficulties, and unfortunately the days in between um, her dialysis treatments, she was just a wet rag. She was worn out, tired, couldn't do anything, would sleep most of those days. So five days of the week for her were made up of not having much of a life. And at that time, my only thought was, well, she's dying of something. Uh, I don't want to get into the specifics. And part of why I didn't want to get into the specifics is because about that time in my life, I was beginning to show slight protein in my uh, urine, which it could be an early indicator of kidneys beginning to go bad. So I was scared more than anything else. So she died, and about eight years ago, no, it was about nine years ago, I was on a trip to Monterey, and has anybody in here ever had a kidney stone? No. It, the pain usually starts in the, in the back on the flank, comes over your hip, and very often will go down into your groin, and it's just a dull ache that you can't concentrate or think of anything else because of the pain. Um, and the stone is a formation of calcium or other minerals in the bloodstream and in the urine that eventually can block or become infected and thereby infect other tissue. So I went to the doctor and thought I had a, 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 a stone being passed and I went to, uh, to see the uh, ultrasound lady. It was right over here in Crown Valley. And they put me in and then they did the usual I got out. She said, you know, if you could wait for just a minute, which didn't alarm me at all. But then she came out about 15 minutes later and said, uh, we want to take some more ultrasounds, which is never a good sign. So I knew the jig was up, something was going on. And that's when they diagnosed me as having polycystic. So polycystic, as several of the other kidney diseases, are genetic. And so it's pretty obvious that I got, um, got it from my mom. Uh, I had prostate cancer. I had cancer for a year and a half back in 1960, no, when was it, 2006. I got that from my dad because that's what he died from. Um, but got through that okay. So I began seeing the doctor and it went from seeing the doctor once every six months to seeing the doctor every um, three months. 
I got hooked up with Scripps, Scripps Hospital down in San Diego and found a nephrologist down there who I got really close to. He seemed to be interested in me as an individual, not just a, a generic kidney patient. Um, so he tested me, and the next thing I knew, I was seeing him every about once every two months. And I remember one appointment he had me, he told me, he said, your numbers are really bad. But at the time, he said also, you're not the typical 65-year-old kidney patient that we see in here. I was really active. I was out in the backyard cutting down trees and uh, exercising on an elliptical for 45 minutes a day and doing a lot of weightlifting. Um, in fact, because of the polycystic, I've lost 25 pounds of muscle tissue in the last three years. Um, suddenly, however, and, and something interesting that's kind of a HIPAA-related thing in the sense that because my numbers were so bad, before I got into dialysis, I would nonetheless have to go to doctor appointments for other related issues and they, where they would take blood. And one particular incident occurred at a local clinic where I had blood taken, and as I'm sitting in the waiting room waiting to see the doctor about the blood results, uh, the nurse at the, front, at the front desk all of a sudden yells out in a loud voice in front of about a dozen other patients who are sitting there, you know, Mr. Salcedo, are you on dialysis? And I said, no. And she said, these numbers indicate you should have been on dialysis a long time ago. And I sat there feeling kind of embarrassed. I got a little pissed off. Um, I wasn't happy about it. And that was the first instance with kidney disease where a person who's in that situation, you begin to feel different from everybody else. And there becomes the beginnings of emotional and mental issues you have to deal with when you know you have that sort of thing going on. And I battled through that without any problems. But it was finally late on a Friday night at 8 o'clock and my nephrologist called me up and he said, Joe, I just checked the blood you gave us last week. And he said, I can't let you walk around anymore. He said, you're a ticking time bomb. You're, you're going to have a major stroke or a heart attack at any minute. And so he had taken me as long and way past the numbers. So on Christmas Eve, I had uh, the transplant or the uh, operation to place a catheter. I decided to go with uh, peritoneal dialysis, which is different from hemodialysis. It's an oversimplification, but hemodialysis is basically where a machine takes the blood out of your body, cleanses it, and then puts it back in your body. Those are the people that go to clinics three days a week. Peritoneal doesn't really deal directly with the blood. With, if you think of your abdomen, you know those funky balloons they sell at Disneyland with the Mickey Mouse inside the big balloon? Yeah. Well, if you think of Mickey Mouse, that balloon inside as your organs, and then you think of the outside balloon as the outside of your abdomen, what happens is I get fluid pumped into my abdomen in between that space of the inside balloon and the uh, interior of the outer balloon. And through an osmosis kind of process, the distillate, the solution I put into my body, takes a lot of the toxins, not all, but a lot of the toxins out of the bloodstream via the capillaries and everything. And then that solution is flushed out of my body, supposedly with the toxins going out and some excess water because kidneys not functioning will allow water to back up in your body, which causes a, another sense of uh, a whole bunch of different kind of problems. So I went with that, um, have been on it for about, going on four years now. Um, I hook up to a machine every night for 10 hours. Technically, I'm hooked up for dialysis for nine hours. It started as eight hours, now it's nine hours. They've come close to having to increase me to even 11 hours because my numbers have dropped so much. Um, however, the reality is it's nine hours, but it takes about 20 minutes for me to hook up to the machine and then another 20 minutes to disconnect from the machine. So instead of nine hours, in reality, it's 10 hours, which has a major problem. For example, I sat in on a class this morning, Christina's class, and I wanted to get there at 8 o'clock before it started at 9 or a little after 8. Well, that meant I had to go to bed last night at about 7 o'clock. Conversely, because of the kidney disease I have, the polycystic, I have a lot of trouble sleeping. If I can get four hours of sleep a night, that's a good night. And again, that's because of a bunch of other side effects that polycystic uh, disease causes. So. I sleep better if I don't go to bed till 1 or 2 or 12 or 1 in the morning. However, that then means I don't get out to do anything until 11 o'clock to noon. So it's had a big impact on the amount of time in my life. Uh, one of the things I thought I would do for you is I threw together kind of a, a layman's version of kidney disease. And, and again, 
I'm not a nephrologist, but I feel sometimes like I become a, a, a cheater nephrologist because of all <laughs> of the stuff I've had to learn. And on that handout, you can see the description, and I tried to put in layman's terms. I kind of thought of the audience being the students in my class. In layman's terms, just to give you a very introductory type of description of the various kidney disease. And the last one, number 10, polycystic kidney disease, is the disease that I have. And right after that, on page three, you'll see, in page four, you'll see about 20, 21 of the various symptoms that people with kidney disease, but particularly uh, polycystic kidney disease, experience. The bold print on the symptoms are the symptoms that I am currently and have been dealing with. One I didn't have on there that I didn't think about and I should have because it's a big one is gout. Gout is a major side effect for kidney disease but particularly in polycystic kidney disease. And because I always feel, and I hope no one is offended, but a picture is worth a thousand words. And incidentally I took these pictures because my doctor requested me to. My right knee, I had suffered a gout attack several years ago, and it was a direct result of, that was a football injury from 51 years ago when I played high school and college football. Um, that knee was susceptible, and the gout buildup in my body went from my toes and my feet up into my knee, which was considered a real kind of unusual place for gout to hit. And as a result, I was on crutches for three weeks until they could drain about, about two cups worth of fluid out of that knee. And when they put it on the microscope, it was all gout. Uh, fluid. So there's a little, as I say, a little uh, couple of pages about the symptoms. On page five you can see I've kind of broken down and back at the end of the handout I have the various sources where I cited a lot of this is from my own personal experience in education and then the various sites. You can see the breakdown of the types of kidney disease that most people suffer. My type of kidney disease afflicts about five percent of the people who suffer in the country from uh, polycystic kidney disease. Then I have two types of dialysis, which was already mentioned before, the hemodialysis, which is kind of the traditional, and the type I have, peritoneal dialysis. And later in the handout, there's a couple of diagrams showing you the basic difference between those kinds of dialysis. Um, again, I think it's important to indicate that dialysis is a treatment, but it is not a cure. It is a limited treatment. At some point in time, the inside of my stomach wall is going to wear out. It's going to break down. The tissue will no longer allow that osmosis. And at that point, my choices are then to go to hemodialysis, which quite frankly, at this point in time, emotionally and mentally, I'm not prepared to do. And then the option is to get a kidney transplant. So um, on the remaining pages, I talk about some of the options that are available, the live donor being the best, getting a kidney from another person. The advantage of that is that you have an opportunity to plan, such as what occurred in his case with his, uh, the person who received his kidney. Uh, they have a chain donation thing, which is where even though a person who wants to donate to you is not a match, they go through a process of trying to find other people and eventually the last person is a match. And that's generically kind of known as chain donation. And there's other kinds. Unfortunately, because my window is closing, uh, every day it gets smaller and smaller. Either my ab abdominal wall is going to give out and not accept the dissolate as well, um, or I'll suffer a stroke or a heart attack. And so as a result of that, I begin to consider another type of donor-based kidneys, which is high-risk kidneys, accident kidneys, accident kidneys, and I'm speaking in very generic terms. The, you can break it down into more details and specifics. But the accidental kidneys are kidneys which have been traumatized in some way. And basically, they use the term, they go to sleep. They become inactive. Um, they will test those and take the chance that upon putting it into a, a person who needs a kidney, that that, bo that person's body will reactivate that kidney and the kidney will wake up. Sometimes that doesn't occur, in which case then you're back on dialysis or worse. Uh, the other kind of uh, high-risk kidneys are kidneys taken from people who have lived high-risk lives. Narcotics people, people who have been in institutions, people who are drug abusers, people who have uh, 
major high-risk life kinds of backgrounds. The only problem with those type of kidneys, even though they've been tested before you get them to make sure none of those background potentials are there, is that they can never tell if one of those diseases is just now percolating in the kidney. So if they give me that kind of kidney, I may be fine for several weeks or a month or so, and then the next thing you know, I might have HIV or something, or AIDS or hepatitis or something like that. Those are the type of kidneys now I'm, ha <clears throat> I'm having to consider because my window is getting so small. Um, there is a picture here, and if you look at that, that kidney on the left, upper left, is your, m what most of your kidneys look like. My kidney, based on what my nephrologist has shown me and my x-rays and my ultrasounds have shown me, my kidney looks somewhere between the second kidney and the kidney at the bottom. What happens is that the cysts start out as little ball-bearing size cysts inside and on the surface of the kidney, and as they expand, the best scenario is to say, take a pound of hamburger, shape it into a bean, stick a bunch of BBs in, in, inside of that kidney, and then pretend that those BBs grow to the size of jawbreakers. Naturally, in the process of growing, they're going to destroy the kidney tissue. That then impacts all of the function of the kidney. And one of the things I didn't know of the hundreds of things that a kidney does, everybody thinks, oh, well, yeah, it takes urine out of your body. Well, it does a whole lot more than that. One of the biggies is that it sends a signal to your bone marrow to produce red blood cells. And most of you didn't get here till just before we got started, but if you notice, when I walked in the room, I had a jacket and a scarf on. That's because even right now, I'm cold. And the reason I'm cold is because of so, many, so much toxin in my body, but also because I'm very anemic. And as most of you probably know, anemia will lead to a bunch of other different kinds of things. So every day is a problem. The other problem with polycystic, and again, I don't mean to, but this was again requested by my doctor. That is typical urination for me every day. About five out of seven days of the week, I have a lot of blood in my urine. Those dark pieces you saw in the urine were pieces of my kidney. More accurately, pieces of the cysts that have ruptured and go out. I came real close one time and this wasn't too long ago, and I, I had to go to the bathroom, I had to urine, urinate, and I couldn't go. I stood there, and I stood there, and I felt all kinds of pressure, and I was about ready to go to the emergency room because I knew what it was. It was a piece of ruptured uh, dis, or cyst blocking my urethra. And just before I went to the hospital, all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> it opened up uh, like a shotgun, and out came these large chunks of uh, cyst tissue. So that's another thing I have to watch. And as I say, these pictures were done at the request of my doctor because when polycystic disease, uh, bleeding from polycystic disease through your urine is very, it's not unusual once the, the disease progresses to the latter stages. And so the doctor asked me for examples of this because he wanted to see, when I say I have blood in my urine, well, that could mean a variety of different things. It could be something that looks like pink lemonade or something that's many times I've had that looks like just pure blood in my urine. So that's what polycystic kidney disease is. But the other 9, 10, 11, depending on who you talk to, which nephrologist you talk to, types of kidney disease also manifest these side effects. And it's almost as if the side effects the pain, the gout, um, all of those things are really almost worse than the original disease. Um, so through education, I've learned not to be afraid. Um, being an older guy, almost being 70, I kind of, and a lot of people ask me, well, you know, they don't ask me, they think, I know, because I can tell. I've been in law enforcement for 35 years and I know how to read people. And they look at me and when they find out how old I am, they go, oh, Joe, you know, it's just, the game's almost over for you. What do you need a kidney for? And my response to that is, from the head up, I feel like I'm 18. <laughs> from the body down, in fact, my doctor said, you're a very, very unusual kidney patient because most of them are not in the physical shape you're in. And he said, that's what's allowed you to live as long. By all rights, you probably should have died in your late 50s. Um, and because of that, I continue to exercise every day on, a, on an elliptical for 45 minutes, very painful because of the knee brace I have to wear because of the gout. Uh, I can't lift weights anymore even though I used to, but as I say, 
I've lost 25 pounds of muscle. <laughs> I have a picture of me when I was weightlifting 10 years ago, and you can, that would be just before I was diagnosed, and you could literally fit me into that old picture of me uh, from lifting weights. I can't do it now because I stand the chance of rupturing, having a hernia, which then means I have to go to hemodialysis. And I, as, as I said, I'm so active, and I saw what my mom went through, even though technology has gotten better, I don't want to go that route. So it's either a transplant or hoping I can last as long as I can on uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis. It's a nasty thing, and what I think a lot of people don't realize is the mental and emotional things that people waiting for a transplant of any kind, pan pancreas, you know, pancreas, liver, um, bone marrow, that sort of thing, they don't realize the journey between the time they're diagnosed until they actually something can happen. And uh, they're usually in a lot of physical pain. Uh, there's a ton of physical, emotional, uh, depression-oriented kinds of feelings you have to work through. To this day, even though I know people are well-meaning, but I hate it when people, I walk up to them who know my situation, say, oh, you look good. All that does is remind me that I don't look good. And, and yet I know people are well-meaning. So there's a lot of psych stuff you have to go through. So anytime you can relieve somebody of that by donating, and I have, in, in fact, at the uh, back of the handout, there's also a couple of pages on what it looks like to be a donor and the, pr the process you have to go through. Now, although that's specific to what Mayo Clinic in Arizona says, each transplant site will have a slightly different procedure and words for the same uh, procedure. It generically gives you an idea of what you have to go through. So in my mind, people who donate, like this guy right here, <laughs> they're saints. They really are. And I want to be around for my three granddaughters. So thank you very much. Thank you for being patient. Michelle, thank you for sharing with us your amazing journey. Thank you. Lacey. Lacey is uh, here to represent not only one legacy. She's going to inform us about the process of donation but also she's gonna to speak to us about her personal journey of being a recipient. What is it you would like us to know, Lacey? Yeah, sure. And thank um, you for being here. Yeah, of course. I feel very connected to all three of these individuals after you guys share. Um, so I work for One Legacy, which is the organ procurement organization. Uh, we, are, um, we are housed in, um, go from Santa Barbara all the way down to San Clemente. And California is very unique. There's four organ procurement organizations. Um, and we are one, we're actually considered the largest just because we have such a dense population within our area. Um, aside from working at One Legacy, I'm uh, extremely thankful and uh, grateful that I am also a heart and kidney transplant recipient. Um, talking about all those side effects brought me super back to uh, when I was in kidney failure. But at 10 months old, I caught a virus that attacked my heart. And um, back then, the, uh, heart transplants in babies was not something that was done. So the doctors actually told my parents to take me home and spend as much time as they could with me because they didn't know what to do and there wasn't any options. And so for our mothers and people who have kids, you can understand that that's, that's not something that you want to hear. Um, and my mom is one of my heroes and that she did everything she could and a nurse eventually told her that a uh, heart transplant was a possibility for me. So packed the car, drove three hours and ended up being listed at Stanford. So that was, uh, I got a heart from a little boy who was in a terrible accident and that was 27 years ago. So I am extremely grateful and thankful for him and the, the decision that his family made for that gift. and. Um, during the process, um, heart transplants, since I said they were so long ago, uh, the medications and the drug levels um, were not at where they are now. So unfortunately, the medication from uh, my heart transplant damaged my kidneys over about 15 year time frame. And so when I was uh, 15 in high school as a sophomore, I just started to uh, be very tired, fatigued, cold all the time, sleeping all the time and uh, went in and then found out that uh, my kidneys were also failing. So another challenge in our life, right? But um, my brother is amazing and uh, stepped forward to be a living kidney donor for me. And he's two years older, it's just me and him as siblings, and he was a perfect match. So 
I was extremely lucky to have that opportunity. But um, talking about all those side effects, it's so true. I, I experienced gout and all of, all of those really, really fun things that come along with kidney disease. And um, right now, there's actually uh, over 114,000 people waiting for a life-saving organ in the United States. And 20% of that is in California. So we have a huge need just in our state in regards to organ donation. And one person can save the lives of eight people. So it's pretty amazing with deceased donation. And there's always people, amazing people like Steve that can be living kidney donors. And they're also doing living liver donors now as well. So you can, be, um, you can do that. And then um, tissue donation is another huge aspect of things. It's not very focused on sometimes, but one tissue donor can enhance the lives of 75 people. So it's pretty amazing. So when you check yes at the DMV or, or sign up on the registry, that's what you're, you're, you're choosing to save lives by be becoming an organ eye and tissue donor by doing that. And with tissue donation, um, it really is amazing. It can help uh, blind people who get cornea donation so they can see. It helps burn victims with, with skin donation. Um, it can help, we've had people wounded in war and come back and get a bone graft and not have to have an amputation. So it really is a really amazing thing you can choose to do with, um, with being a registered organ and tissue donor. So, yeah. Very good, thank yeah, you so much. no problem. I'd like to take this opportunity to open up um, the Q&A for the panel members. I have several questions, but I'm going to hold mine to give you all an opportunity to ask any questions of our panel members. Uh, I'm not sure you might know this, but my dad has been on dialysis for, like, for 10 years. My dad has been on that for 10 years. I never asked him, but did they want women? Or did they want them? A limit. As far as how long you can live on dialysis, you know, it's so individual. It depends on, you know, what, first of all, how old he is, what other medical conditions he has, how well he takes care of himself. Um, one of the biggest things that limits a person's life on dialysis is a cardiac disease, heart disease. And that's because not only do the kidneys filter waste products, they also regulate calcium and phosphorus metabolism. So I'm, I'm sure your dad has to take a bunch of pills every time he eats um, to um, excrete phosphorus. And when there's too much phosphorus and calcium in the blood, that turns the blood vessels into eggshell, chalk, and it causes heart disease, um, vascular disease, blood vessel disease. And that's what can um, limit someone's life on dialysis. Of course, their susceptibility to infection because they're always having to put needles in their arms or do the peritoneal dialysis. Infection is another big problem. Um, not watching their diet, eating too much potassium. Potassium is something that, can, that regulates your heart, and if you eat too much potassium, your heart can stop suddenly. Um, so those are the things that can limit a person's life on dialysis. Um, every year, the technology improves. And so, you know, a person's life, we, we try to, you know, in help a person live as long as they possibly can on dialysis. Um, and regardless of what their kidney function, why their kidney function declined, their treatment options are the same, some form of dialysis or a kidney transplant. Um, when, um, when, I, when the doctor, my Dr. King said, I can't avoid it anymore, I have to put you on dialysis. Um, I remember we had a conversation, and we were talking, uh, and I know way more about potassium, phosphorus, <laughs> and you ever protein. Wanted to <laughs> but I remember him telling me, he says, you don't need any bananas, right? We've talked about this before. And I said, oh, yeah, no, I know, potassium. Bananas are loaded with potassium. And he told me, with your numbers, if you were to eat five bananas in one day, there's a very high likelihood you'd have a major heart attack or stroke, just from the bananas. <laughs> and as far as your dad's medication, I have to take, they're called binders. And what they do is they help to take phosphorus and other minerals uh, out of your gut so that they're not necessarily all absorbed into the bloodstream. And that's why they call them binders. They bind to those, those items. Um, I take two of them. I take about 25 pills a day. And most, half of that are the binders. One of the two binders costs for a uh, a bottle of 180, which in reality is a 30-month supply, because I'll take anywhere from four to 
eight a day, one of those binders costs for 180 pills $1,200. Um, I was paying about $500 for a long time, and finally my social worker down in San Diego, my nephrologist, dug up some coupons <laughs> where I get, for only 5 bucks a 30-day supply. Well, I use up a 30-day supply in about a week and a half, the reality is. So I'm constantly having to play this balancing game. But if it wasn't for insurance, people who need organ transplants would be in a whole lot of trouble, mm -hmm. whole lot of trouble. Thank you. Are there any other questions for our panel members? Hi, ladies. I have one. Please. My mother had open heart surgery. Originally, they told us to take her home. There's nothing else they can do. And then we had USC's case manager took her on. And everything was perfect with the heart surgery. And up until she was getting the pacemaker, the dye went into her kidneys. Oh. So that's what damaged her kidneys. And now she's on kid, um, dialysis three days a week. But right then when it happened, I offered to give my kidney. And the doctor says, absolutely not. Why would that, why would he, just because of her age or because of the situation? I'm like, I was puzzled and I was just like, wow, I can't give my mother my kidney. You know what I mean? So I was just, to this day, I still wonder why. <laughs> I could have probably saved her from going to dialysis if that was something. Um, well, without knowing the particulars, <laughs> yeah, that's how old your mom is, how old you are, I mean, you know, it, it's, I, I, I don't understand why someone would say off the bat, absolutely not, unless he was just trying to help you to, you know, uh, adjust to one situation before jumping into another. One thing we tell, uh, I tell all of my recipients, a living donor transplant is not an emergency surgery. It's not, hurry up, we got to do it right now. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's not, mm -hmm. because we have to protect the donor, and we have, we have one, one uh, chance to make the space shuttle work. Mm -hmm. Space shuttle goes up into orbit when everything is perfect, because if we don't, it's a disaster. And we have, the, we have the ability to make it perfect. So we get the recipient ready, we get the donor ready, and then we put the two teams together and we go to surgery in an in a, uh, elective manner, never in an emergency manner. Mm -hmm. So may, maybe that's what he was referring to. It's not an emergency surgery. We can't do it as an emergency surgery. Now, when a deceased donor becomes available, we have 24, 48 hours is the best time frame to get that kidney into a recipient. So yes, that's an emergency. Things are moving very, very fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the, the, off the top of my head, that's probably what was, was happening with your mom. They wanted, she needed to settle down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, perhaps if you pursued it, I don't know. My guess would be that the cardiac history your mom had influenced the doctor a lot too, because the issue of surviving a transplant procedure in older patients, and I would probably fall into that category. Um, there's one other thing I thought of when we were talking about this, is that once a person gets put on a waiting list for any type of transplant, um, and I, don't I haven't heard people talk about this, but I know other trans people on lists must experience it. Suddenly the medical field that's so very anxious to help you out becomes fearful to you. And here's what I mean. In my situation, I had cancer once before, and generally speaking, I think it's a five-year wait to be put out back on a transplant list if you've had cancer. So if they discovered cancer in me tomorrow, I'd be off the two lists I'm on and have to wait for five years, which ain't going to work for me. Okay. However, um, what happens is that once you get put on the list and you're good for one year till they have to test you completely all over again, which is what's happens you it's like be joining a club you know you got to pay your dues every year by going back and Didn't going through part of. four or five <laughs> days of testing but now because of that every time I go see a doctor for anything particularly where blood is going to be drawn or x-rays or ultrasounds I'm really fearful that they're going to find something that's going to keep me from being on that list anymore mm -hmm. so now going to see a doctor has become a very fearful thing and it causes a lot of mental and emotional stress that I don't think most people who hear about transplant issues ever thinks about. But I know the people who are on waiting lists do think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, know, you know you're on borrowed time. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And what's so incredibly sad is that we, we have the ability to do transplant with almost 100% success rate. But again, I tell my patients, I don't have a closet full of kidneys for you. 
Um, I mean, if we need a new dialysis machine, I go order one from a catalog. I can't order it. I need a donor. Um, we need a living donor or we need someone to donate their, their organs at the time of their death. Um, there's just no other way around it. Um, and, and that's why we have to reach out to the public, increase awareness. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel motivated to be a living donor, that's a wonderful thing. Not everybody is. Not everybody can. Um, and um, if you're ever in a circumstance to become a, be a family member of a potential deceased donor, that's truly the gift of life. Um, and that's what we hope to give more education to people um, about organ donation. There's another social aspect that, again, I think most people, you know, I just must think too much. <laughs> I, I, and, you don't. And Everything you're saying is resonating. So. For males who are on kidney transplant lists who have polycystic disease, which is what I have, a lot of normal everyday activities you have to think about or you think you have to think about. If I go to the movies and I go downstairs to go into the bathroom to urinate, if there's four or five guys at all the other spaces and I'm gonna to have to squeeze in between two guys, I will go into the stall. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that is I cannot tell, there's a 50-50 chance or better than 50 chance that I'm gonna urinate a lot of blood. And when people see that, and guys don't lie, you do sometimes <laughs> look at one way or the other. When people, <laughs> they do. when people do that, when people see that blood, That's scary. they react. Mm -hmm. They're traumatized, you know, at a certain level, and, and they kind of look at you like, what the hell's going on here? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put people through that, and I don't want to be the victim of feeling I did something wrong. Yeah. And so you, you, little things like that, there's hundreds of those kinds of little things that when you're on a transplant list, but particularly the kidney with polycystic, which of all the kidney diseases, is the one that's more prone to bleed than the other kidney diseases. It's, a nephrologist once told me about three years ago, he said, you, oh yeah, you got the nasty kidney disease because of the cysts and you see what the kidney looks like at some point in time. So there's a lot of underlying social issues for people waiting for a kidney and depending on what type of kidney disease they have that people don't even realize is going on. And again, the, my point is it puts people who are waiting because of that particular kind of disease under a lot of extra stress. Many times they don't even realize they're under it, but it is. Uh, you know, if I get four hours of sleep a night, that's a good night because kidney disease affects your sleep rhythms and the anemia and the toxins in your blood don't allow you to sleep. You get rest, restless leg syndrome and a lot of other things. And so um, all of those things you gotta deal with, you don't wanna share them with other people to, to get some appreciation for what you're going through because you kind of feel guilty telling those people about those things. Mm -hmm. And so you sometimes have a tendency to, if, you're, if you don't work it through, if you don't be real with yourself, if you don't talk to the medical people who understand and accept it and don't see it as unusual, um, you have to be real careful because you will actually isolate yourself from other people as a result. Thank you. I have a question I'd like to ask. What is the biggest myth of being an organ tissue or um, kidney donor, organ donor. What is the biggest myth that so you funny, think we people? Just, <laughs> we just talked about this question because it comes yeah. up a lot. Um, so I think for registering yourself as an organ donor, the biggest myth is that if um, a medical professional is to see that pink dot or know that you're a donor, they're not gonna help save your life. Right. So I think honestly that is probably one of the number one myths and unfortunately with our entertainment business and different uh, programs out there show all of the misconceptions about organ, don organ donation, then people automatically believe those. It's completely not true. Um, the medical professionals are there to save your life. That is what they, you know, signed up to do there for what they do as a career. They're not going to care or even want to know about organ donation when you come in and something was to happen. So, and also the doctors that, um, you have to be pronounced uh, brain dead by two doctors before our t one legacy. We have a team of people that actually come in and approach families on if they want to be, if they want to say yes for their loved one to be an organ donor. So they have to be uh, declared by two doctors um, that are not the same doctors that are facilitated in the in the process. So it's totally not true. <laughs> yeah. 
Are people who are pink dotted <laughs> automatically on on the register? Yes. So, so I, I think we should be clear about so that. Donate so Donate Life California, which is the organization that manages the list for all of the state of California. So when you check yes, question number six at the DMV, you are put onto that registry. So if something were to happen to you and you, one in 200 deaths are eligible to become organ donors. So a lot of people don't really understand that it's not a common thing for you to be an organ donor. Um, you have to be pronounced brain dead. So in order for that to happen, you have to die in a certain way. Sounds kind of crazy, right? <laughs> but um, so in order to do that, that is um, when you make that decision, we as an organization would bring in the registry. So when you um, sign up on the registry, you get a document of gift. So that is a legally binding document that says that you wish to become an organ, eye, and tissue donor. So if something was to happen and you, and you become a potential organ donor, we would bring in that document to your family and say that your loved one wanted to be an organ donor. They checked yes at the registry. Um, so that is what the registry specifically is. It's managed by organization Donate Life California. And that is what we as One Legacy are always promoting out in the community to help people sign up for that. Um, we are actually pretty low on the list in regards to how many people are signed up. If you look at other states, they have about 70 to 80 percent of their of their population, we have about 35. Mm. So we have a very, very large amount of people that still need to sign up on the registry. And that's what we're here today to promote, but also just understanding to talk to your family. Um, we always stress talking to your family about what you would want, because in that situation, we have donor families that their their children or whoever it was that passed away talked to them about that decision. Mm -hmm. And they said it was the most easiest part of the process because they had already had that conversation and they knew that 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 they wanted their loved one wanted to be an organ donor so other than we always encourage you to register but also talk to your family about the decision because that can make a huge difference um, if that situation was to arise are there any other questions for our panel yeah but now that you've heard the bad news the good news is that there are <laughs> benefits to having kidney disease i get a handicap placard <laughs> So don't feel down. <laughs> I'm living it up. Okay. I, I want to add one other thing, too, um, which was kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, when I was going through the process and getting ready for the surgery, my surgeon said, uh, I, I started to say something about Jamie, and he goes, I don't want to know anything about the recipient. I'm only concerned about you, and you're, the team is just concerned about your health. That's all I look at. That's all I care about. He goes, there's a whole team that's there for Jamie that's doing the same thing. So in effect, you know, you really do have um, complete attention and care from, from the medical team that's, that is, is assigned to you. And even when they were wheeling me in on the gurney, they said, is there any reason that you don't want to do this? You have complete control over the decision up to, you know, when they put you out. But truly, they asked me all along, is there any reason or do you have any concerns or, you know, do you any want doubts. to change any mm -hmm. doubts? Do you want to change your mind at any point? Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, really nice to have that kind of freedom as well as that kind of attention. So I would say that... Um, you know that that sort of is a little bit different than your answer, but it's in the in a, in the living donor situation. I think um, it's really important to know that you're being cared for, and that you're you know you're getting professional attention yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah, and they do. I mean, you could speak to this too. They do a whole evaluation process of if someone wants to be a living donor. My brother got really annoyed because <laughs> he they kept asking him like every step of the process. Do you still want to do this? Is this still? So? And he's like, stop asking me. Yes, <laughs> like stop asking. But it's. I was just really happy that they did do that because it's important to know that this is something that you want to do, and especially with a sibling um, situation because like. Were your parents trying to co coerce your brother into doing this? Right. Is this something, you know, what is, right. what's the real reason? Is it, ju is it truly because you want to do this? So, um, and that aspect is really, really important. Right. Well, the other thing that we tell living donor candidates also is that we might find something wrong with you that you didn't know. <laughs> um, and most people think that's a good idea. Um, but it could affect your ability to get life insurance or health insurance or your ability to have certain kinds of jobs. Um, and um, so we do, you know, counsel you about that. Um, and you do, you get the best physical exam that you'll ever have mm -hmm. um, because we'll, we will test from everything. Because 
as much as we want to help the recipients, we don't want to put the living donor in jeopardy, their life in jeopardy. Um, we want to be able to look you in the eye and say that after you've donated your kidney, your life will be no different than anyone else your age that has two kidneys. You will live just as long. Um, you will have no greater risk of having kidney disease yourself. You'll be able to do all the things that you want to do um, uh, with your life um, after being a kidney donor. There was an incident recently where a Long Beach State, this is when Long Beach State still had a football program, uh, one of the athletes there uh, got caught in a gang incident, got shot, and it destroyed one of his kidneys. He had expected to be drafted to play in the professional football, the National Football League. Um, he nonetheless tried out. The team built a special set of shoulder pads which had extra, extra Teflon covering to cover his back. And he played several years with one kidney mm -hmm. um, and succeeded. Mm -hmm. I'm sure his nephrologist said, no way in hell should you be playing yeah. football. Yeah, if you were a <laughs> kidney like, donor, yeah. we'd probably say, please don't play, please don't play just, tackle just football. But just to give you the example of how, it, it, from everything I've read and everything I've been told, it won't limit you and other than going through a little discomfort as a result of the operation and a recuperation period, um, you're supposed to still live a normal life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, panel. I do want to conclude by asking our panel members, and I think you've already addressed it, but given the stats that you said in California with such low rates of people willing to donate, what is the one message you want to leave with us and that you want us to carry forward. What is, what is it you want us That's to take away really from That's a really great point. Um, I think for me is just to be educated on organized tissue donation, talk to your family, make that decision, and then uh, share it with your loved ones and register on the on, online if that's something that you want to do. I mean, it's, it's a total personal decision, but it, the one thing you can do is um, sign up on the registry and talk to your family and donate blood, donate, d do other things that, are, that allow you to save another life because there's, and as Steve can contest this, there's nothing else better in this world than you can do to help someone else. So, If you're a person waiting for a uh, transplant of some kind, any kind, but kidneys in particular. I've had uh, a couple of people who were perfect matches and got turned down. Um, several of them because, as was mentioned, um, during the initial screening on the phone, one had been taking two types of blood pressure medications which immediately shot them down. Often they'll do a phone interview and then they'll put you through the testing at a later date. Um, and I had another situation where um, Apparently, a lady who is a friend of my wife was a perfect match for me. And when she spoke it over with her husband, she, the husband talked her out of it. So um, you can't, as a person who's waiting for some type of organ, you really have to get prepared mentally, emotionally, and not get too excited. You've got to find that middle ground. You get too excited when there's a possibility. And if you don't control yourself, you're in for a big drop of depression as a result of it not occurring. So there's a lot of mental exercises you have to go through being on a waiting list. And again, another thing that the normal person, the layman person doesn't realize. And so they may wonder, why, you know, why is my husband, why is my brother so down and depressed and yada, 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 and he's not excited about anything besides the chemical makeup in his body, which is totally screwed up because of that disease, there's also, also, also that mental emotional process that he or she may not have worked themselves through. And that's where talking to transplant count, uh, counselors, to doctors, reading about it, learning as much as you can, even though that's very frightening to do, because that mortality issue is always there. Um, you, you learn to take care of yourself. And so if you see somebody waiting for a, an organ and you see they're not who they used to be emotionally, mentally, there are things you can do to help them out because they are going through something. You just don't realize it. I had the opportunity to, in my firm, the um, business that I'm in, uh, there was a call from one of the employees that's up in the Berkeley office and he wanted to talk to me about my kidney donation. And so I was very candid with him and told him everything I could you know, tell him about it. And um, he was thinking of, of becoming a donor. And it turned out it was for the one of the founders of our firm uh, was in need of a kidney. And uh, 
so anyway, he went ahead. Th they were a match, and he was able to give that uh, kidney to her, and uh, she lived for another four years. And I felt really great because I, I feel like you need to be able to talk about it so that people know, you know, what it's like. So um, uh, I made a point of getting involved in, in doing things like this, you know, talking to people, letting them know, so that you aren't caught without any knowledge and, and the situation might occur to you. So with me, it was, you know, very positive. And the fact that I was able to talk to somebody else and encourage them made a difference. So I'm just, that's, that's what I'm figuring is the next step for me is to keep talking about it. And I guess the, what I would leave you with is um, I've, I've been a transplant coordinator for more than 30 years. And when we first started, uh, when I first started working with these group of patients, living donors made up more than 50% of our transplants. And over the years, I've seen a change in that to the point where now it's only about 20% of our population gets a living donor. And that's because the, our general population has health issues. You know, we have an epidemic of high blood pressure and diabetes and obesity. And um, diabetes and high blood pressure are two of the leading causes of kidney failure. Um, so I, I think that if, if nothing else, the take home message might be to, you know, get your blood pressure checked. Get your blood sugars checked. If you're pro, you know, prone to high blood pressure, diabetes, get good health care so that you don't end up in a position that you don't want to be in. Um, and those are reasons why people can't be donors. If you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, um, you can't be, a do uh, can't be an organ donor. Um, again, we, we are able to do wonderful things with organ transplantation, um, but we need donors. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to thank our panel again for sharing your amazing journeys and stories and information. Thank you all for being here.